everybody what he said. Amen. God is faithful and God is good all the time. And we are so, so glad you are here with us. And we're going to take just a moment to let you know the purpose of this gathering is, uh, is the state of the church address uh, to a broken community. How many of you know that we have serious problems uh, in our county, in our community? How many of you know that 4,000 people average dying of overdose in our, in our state every year? That means more people die in our state than was lost in 9-11. So we have, we have some serious problems. And, uh, but we have decided as pastors that this all church gathering should be the theme of we need to communicate and inform you. And uh, so before we get started with prayer, uh, we're going to pass the microphone down to all the pastors. And would you make them welcome as they say who they are? Uh, Barry Pettit from Southside Church of Christ. Barry <laughs> Marshall, First Presbyterian Church. Unity Fellowship Church. Todd Mauer, Crossroads Christian Church. Here we go at uh, Mount Pleasant Church in Kingston, and I'm uh, and I run Fayette Recovery Center. John Black with the Gathering Place. I'm Bruce Morris, my pastor here from New Church. Let's stand together, folks. Let's open up the service with prayer. Uh, pastor Keith from Unity Fellowship will be getting giving us our prayer. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Let us pray. Well, Father God, we thank you for this evening. God, we come together and we lay down who we are and what we're about and we become one. We thank you for the power of one. Where, Lord, you said that you and the Father were one and we could be one with you. Today we come with one mind, one heart, and one mission. That is to bring revival to Fayette County and to remove the spirit of anarchy, suicide, craziness, God, that goes on every day. And we ask, God, that you would just bring the spirit of love, peace, and unity into our community. I thank you for every church that is gathered here today. I thank you for every person who has taken the time to come out here tonight. God, it is a witness to show that we are all concerned about what is happening in our community. Tonight, God, will you hear our voice as one. Will you see us move as one, Lord? And will you call us, Lord God, to come together as one? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. How we're going to work this this evening is through, throughout this service, there will actually be victory testimonies. How many of you like to see victory testimonies? Well, would you please take a look at the screens? Our first video testimony today. Mark Hubbard. Okay. My name is Mark Hubbard and I am an addict and uh, I'm here today to share a story about uh, for anyone who has ever done something they didn't want to do and couldn't stop doing it. Um, I want to talk about my struggle with addiction and the process of recovery that I'm involved in right now. Uh, I've been in recovery now for two years and uh, it has been an amazing journey uh, but it has a very dark beginning. Uh, I lived in addiction for about 14 years. It started with alcohol and uh, progressed from there to other substances. But what I can tell you is that before I ever picked up a substance, I struggled with addiction, doing things and going too far with whatever I did, not being able to stop until I couldn't do it anymore. Uh, that's pretty common for those of us who understand and have lived a life uh, of addiction. When I added substances to that, it became a whole different monster. And basically over a 14 year period, I, uh, I found myself doing things that I never thought I would do, living in ways that I'd never imagined, and pushing the people in my life away who really cared, who really mattered, uh, and choosing substances and uh, um, the darkness of that lifestyle over and above everything that was important and had meaning in my life. Uh, substances aren't the issue. The issue is something that's broken within me. And my struggle really started with me making a choice to simply do what I wanted to do and not caring about what anybody else thought about that or how it would affect them 
and even ultimately affect myself. The story of hope and my journey of recovery really begins with a lady from a church, a uh, Heritage Memorial Church here in Washington Courthouse who simply invited me to join her uh, for a worship service. And I came to such a point in my brokenness, such a, a low point in my life, that I called her and said, I need to come to church. And I did come to church, and I was high when I came to church. I could barely sit up. I was falling over in the pew, and, uh, and I just kept coming. And God said to me each Sunday that I came through the pastor that he loves me. He loved me. He loves me. And I heard that message, but I went, uh, one particular Sunday I went, and the message was, I know what you're doing. It's going to destroy you, and you need to stop. And I was terrified at the thought that, that, um, that, that that's what I heard. So I didn't go the next Sunday. Uh, I actually stayed home and did what I'd been doing for, at that point, about 14 years. I was absolutely at a point of brokenness. And I said to God, I can't stop doing what I'm doing. And I know I'm going to die. And if you love me, you need to step in. Uh, when I was at the hospital, I was struggling with the decision whether to ask for help or not. I knew that if I asked for help that things would radically change, but I knew that if I didn't ask for help, I was most likely going to die. That decision to ask for help absolutely and radically changed my life. Um, that's when I went into a rehab program and uh, made, learned a better way to live. I want to talk about my journey of recovery. And that has been an amazing, like I said, uh, the 21st of September uh, is my two-year anniversary for uh, coming into recovery. And um, I believe with all my heart that, you know, there are people who give up the substances but who live in misery because they haven't found um, a better way to live without substances. So I had mentioned that my uh, addiction is a spiritual issue for me and it had to do with the fact that when I took charge of my life I went in this direction that was destructive and that ultimately led to me almost dying. The solution for me is a spiritual solution. It's finding a better way to live. It's coming to the end of myself and surrendering. In recovery, we find a better way to live and we find, um, we find out what really the issues are and, uh, and we find healing and help uh, and a better a purpose in life that um, that we've maybe never had before. I literally had come to a place in my life where I never thought I would be happy again, where I never thought that I would have a relationship with the people who mattered, and where I never thought that I could feel good about myself and have respect for myself. Um, because of what God is doing in my life, because of the gift of the people that I surround myself with, with now in recovery, and because of my daily dependence upon God, I'm finding hope and help, strength and deliverance, and really a better way to live uh, with a future, with a, a message to carry, and with a purpose in life. Good evening. Powerful stuff, wasn't it? We might need another round of applause for that video. That was really fun. Cool. Mark did a great job with that. It's great to be with you this evening. We are part of the Praise and Team ministry here at Heritage Memorial Church, and we're very happy to be with you. And those of you that are willing and able and want to stand and worship with us during these two songs, if you want to do that, that would be great. We're going to sing acknowledgement that there is power in the name of Jesus. Do we believe that this morning? Power to break the chains that are holding our community down and show us what part we can play in that community this morning. Let's all sing together today.
tell the same old lies. If you're trying to feel the same old holes inside, there's a better life. There's a better
you know, get, get the paramedics. <laughs> uh, first, I want to uh, uh, just praise Jesus Christ in my life and what he's done. And he's still do doing it every day. Uh, I'm the director of, uh, of about seven rehab centers. And uh, we're seeing a lot of people. We just, uh, we are overflowed. Uh, by law, we only have 15 in there, and uh, we have a waiting list of hundreds, really. And so, but I want to tell you about recovery. Uh, I've been around recovery a long time in my life. I pastored full time for 12 years. When I was at Asbury Seminary in Kentucky, I also got uh, a lot, a lot of counseling training at University of Kentucky. And uh, when United Methodist Church wanted to move me. I was at a place for 11 years, I just said no. You know, sometimes you just gotta say no. You gotta say yes a lot, but I said no. And that job was open, and so I already had counseling experience, and that's why I'm here tonight. Uh, that led to that 28 years ago. I got that job when I was three. <laughs> so, you know, it's not, it's not easy. But I'm gonna talk to you about uh, uh, addiction. They don't, I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you in 10 minutes what I tell uh, some classes when I taught at OCU, High Christian University, for three semesters. So I'm going to get in uh, all that in, in a few minutes. What, one is, and some of you are going to disagree with me, and, and that's okay. I love, you know, I, I love church people so much. And, uh, but I truly believe disease is an addiction. That, I mean, addiction is a disease that is progressive, treatable, and fatal. And the brain changes. L literally, you can take MRIs and spectrographies of people who have addiction. Their brain changes. Heroin is one of those drugs that li literally on a MRI, uh, they, they call it brain melt. The brain literally, it doesn't literally melt, but it looks like it is. They have all these, it looks like holes in there, but they're not holes. It's where it's dead. You know, when our first um, message of victory, he talked, and he said he went to rehab. Rehab is good just to get people on a place to think. When you're impaired from drugs, you can't even think. You, you are just in a hole, and, and that hole keeps closing in around the person. I want to have you guys do, do a couple of things, because pa Pastor Morrison said you guys are really smart. At least from Heritage Church, okay? The rest of you, I, I, I don't know, okay? We're going to give some tests afterwards. But I want you to raise your left hand. Okay? Put it down, please. Right hand. Okay? Say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Do you guys know how you did that? There was a brain pathway. You got a brain pathway for voice, for movement, for everything in your brain. You know, the thing of it is, I tell my congregation, the worst thing you can get in a doctor's office is, you know when they shine the light in the ear and the light comes out on the wall? <laughs> That's the worst thing that can happen to you, okay? But, I'm going to tell you about the brain pathway of addiction. The same brain pathway for addiction is the same pathway for survival. I want you to hear this. If you, you know, a lot of our kids and grandkids have no idea. I swam in Yellowbud Creek and, uh, and we call it Crick then, and Deer Crick, okay? Now, if you got underneath the water and you got your foot in a root and you couldn't get out, God made us in a way that we would fight every single way to get out of there. We'd rip our skin off. We'd, we'd actually break a bone to get out. That is survival. The same pathways, medically they have proven that, they're the same pathways for addiction. When a person, especially the biggies, I call them the big three, meth, crack, and opioids. And opioids is what we talk about a lot. And those opioids are uh, Percocets, Bic Bicodins, um, and everything else made with the poppy plant. Then unfortunately we have a lot of synthetics. Fentanyl, carfentanil, Demerol. And a lot of those are being mixed now with the heroin. 
in Fayette County, they're even starting to use fentanyl by itself. One of the few counties in the state that are doing that. But the brain, when you cross that threshold of addiction, your brain is saying, I have to have it or I'm going to die. You need that perspective in your head. There's nothing casual or minimal about people getting in recovery. They need a lot of help. I believe God is at the center of it. I really do. But they need help from people who know what they're talking about. A lot of people give a lot of information to people, and it's just wrong. It's wrong. And it's sad, too. And I'm telling you, families, if you're here of, a, of an addicted individual, you need to be encouraged about them, encouraged about them getting help. We have parents who literally work against us because they, they say, you don't need help, you just need to quit. And then they die. And then the regrets. And sometimes we in the church blow it. Imagine that. We really do. We get somebody saved who is, who is an addict and we encourage them to death. Oh, you're doing great. You're doing fine. I had a pastor in Southern Ohio tell a guy he got accepted the Lord. You don't need to go to treatment. You have the Lord now. I'm going to tell you a quick story. Eight month, months ago, uh, not in Washington Courthouse or Circleville, but another town in Southern Ohio, the grandparents of this 26-year-old mom go, go to my church. Two of the most faithful Christians in our church. They love the Lord. Their, their granddaughter went to a church in Chillicothe. She went forward on Sunday morning. And I'm telling you, she, she found Jesus Christ. She accepted Him. It's a Baptist church, so they said, come back in the evening, you're going to get baptized. She got baptized that night about 6.30. Everybody was encouraging her. Even the grandparents in my church, they called me three or four times. I said, she's got to get in rehab. She needs help. She has the Lord. She's heaven bound, you know. But she needs help. She overdosed and died that night at 11.30. Her boyfriend come over with heroin. Guys, we have the Lord. And He can do great things. And He can heal people. He can heal them at the moment. And I believe it. But people need skills to stay, so and to stay sober. They need help to stay sober. They need help to stay clean. They need each other too. They need that help. And as that brain is saying, i got to have this to survive, they need all the help they can get. You have somebody walk in this church who's an addict, and they accept the Lord, you give them help that works. Help that works. And you know what we Christians do sometimes? We want to help people because it makes us feel good. And sometimes we don't have a clue what we're talking about. And, you know, and I said we we just had a woman in our church had open heart surgery, like you know, like this past week. She didn't ask me to do it, <laughs> did she? <laughs> Unless she was insane or something, but she wasn't. Why do we give advice about addiction sometimes and we don't know what we're talking about? I've stopped talking and preaching now, haven't I? It's the truth, isn't it? Guys, we have people dying and hurting. They need help. Lots of help. And as we work together, they can get lots of help. You know, thank, really thanks for having me. My wife was tied up tonight. She couldn't come. You know, but our standard is she asked me if anybody threw anything at me tonight, and I'll tell her nobody did. So don't try it now. I really appreciate you having me tonight. Thank you.
Hi, my name is Maddie Wallace and I am the Youth Coalition Chair for the Lead Out Loud program at Miami Trace High School. For through our program, we help kids and help them learn about being substance free and why it's important. And I think it's a great thing to get involved in because in our community, we really need a bunch of community leaders, even if they're youth. It's very important for all of us to get involved because we all have one life to live and we need to live it well. And that includes helping others. And this is the way we can do that. Um, my name is Kiara Heights. I am working with the Faith and Coalition group uh, to help improve the community step by step. Unfortunately, substance abuse has increased over the years, and due to that, families are destroyed, lives, futures, um, like moms are doing drugs while they have a unborn child in their stomach, and it's causing damage to their future and kind of how they adapt to the world outside of it. Um, Family-wise and family destruction, families are falling apart because the all the people are choosing to do drugs and therefore it's kind of messing up the family, like the way they think about them and how like they act towards their family members and the disconnection, like there's no connection there anymore because these people are choosing drugs over their lives, their futures, and instead of wanting to survive, they're choosing to die. Um, I think coalitions are such a big thing because it helps show like other people how they can get themselves out of doing drugs and alcohol and it'll help lead their future and if they find somebody who's stuck in a situation where they're doing substance, um, they're like substance abuse, then that kind of helps them say, hey, like, let me help you, let me be that leading hand because either I've been through the situation or I haven't, but I know that I can help you get out of it step by step by improving your life. I think that drugs are such a big problem in the community and not even just in ours and other communities and it tears apart lots of family, especially because it alters your mind and that can cause you to do lots of things that will hurt your family, it can cause you to get in car crashes and it's just as bad as alcohol, which alcohol is also a drug. I think they're a good idea because if you start young, they will grow up to go on the right path instead of going on drugs. If you start with the younger generations, which are our future, then you won't have the problem. I'm Levi Heights and I'm in the Break Free program. I'm in this because I found out what happened to my family and it wasn't a very good thing. And what I think it means is to like go around helping other people and helping them find a new path. Because if you start down a dark path, then you'll lead to like a very dangerous, like ending. Break Free program has like lots of people and if we start with one family it can lead to another and we can come as a giant society. Good evening, my name is Nick Sims. I'm the worship pastor at Crossroads Christian Church. It's a pleasure to be here with you all to sing and share a couple songs with you. Uh, this is not our entire team. I was making a joke earlier, this is the travel size. <laughs> but uh, we are, like I said, excited to be here, excited to share these songs with you all, <coughs> worship together as one church together in our proclamation that we need Jesus. We've realized that and that's why we've gathered around these problems. And we said we need help and those of us that don't have addiction need help and those that don't think that they struggle with anything, you need help. You know, we need Jesus for everything and that's where we start. So let's stand up this, uh, this evening and sing that together. Go. 
Christ alone be praised no matter what. My name is Marcus Bradley. I'm 42 years old. I'm married and have a five-year-old daughter. Um, I'm an accountant and an author, and I live here in Washington Courthouse. I've been walking with the Lord for about 16 years now. Before that, I was addicted to crack cocaine. I, I was raised right. I was raised in the church, but uh, as a teenager, I started to drink some. Um, Within a couple years, I was addicted. And for me, addiction progressed from alcohol to weed and pills to cocaine, um, anything I could get my hands on, really, and, until uh, crack took over my life. Eventually, I lost, I lost everything. I um, had no money or car or uh, job, no friends had no hope. There was nothing to live for, really. It was uh, a very dark world. Until February 24th, 2002, and that's the day I gave up. I uh, hit rock bottom, and my sister, who lived three hours away at the time, agreed to let me come and stay one night with her with the thought that we would find an inpatient rehab the next day. Well, two things happened that next day. One, there was no inpatient facility that could take me in right away. And two, I opened the Bible and started reading in Matthew. Something happened to me that day while I was reading. Um, Matthew 10.39 made me freeze in my tracks. It says, whoever finds his life will lose it. And whoever loses his life for my sake will surely find it. Life was exactly what I needed. I was tired of being dead. That very moment, God came over me, and I had a, a very real experience with Him. Right then, I gave up my old life, and I accepted a new one. Um, it was a very real, emotional, spiritual, and powerful time. But even then, I'm not certain I would have stayed sober for the long haul if it wasn't for the people. The support I received from people in the days and months ahead was vital for me. Um, when I was three days sober, I walked into a small church in northern Ohio. I'd never been there before, didn't know anybody there. But when I walked in, they welcomed me with open arms. They accepted me for who I was. And they plugged me in right away, feeding the homeless and uh, gave me opportunities to fellowship 
with others. It seemed like there was always something to look forward to. Um, I remember oh, about a month into my sobriety when I got a car. It had over 400,000 miles, no pain on it whatsoever. But, uh, well, it sounded like and felt like the front end was going to fall completely off every time I hit a bump. But, but it was great. It got me back and forth to the job that someone from that church had arranged for me. I stayed active there at that church for over a year. I treasure that time. It was instrumental in my recovery. Uh, the most important thing I learned there is that God's love is unconditional. There is forgiveness. There is hope. There is purpose. And God has a plan. It's been almost 16 years now, and uh, as I keep growing with Jesus, His will continues to work itself out in my life. I, I'm back in courthouse now. I'm, well, I've got a family. I own a home. And I've published two books. It's just mind-blowing, really. Uh, God is so good, and it's amazing to see what God can do in someone's life when His people put His love into action. There is healing. People are restored and made new. Whoever loses his old life will find new life in Christ. By the way, that little church that I went to 16 years ago that changed my life forever, it's called New Life. And that's exactly what I have. And that's my story. have real victory stories. It can be done, praise God. Uh, we, we know that you can't talk about drugs without talking about those who have to enforce it. And uh, we have Vernon stand forth with us tonight. Vernon, would you come? And uh, I asked him, can you do it in five minutes? You know what he said? What street do you want me to talk about? <laughs> <laughs> but would you make him welcome, our own sheriff. So if I look over here, you know, I'm, I'm trying to find out what my five minutes are, uh, because five minutes we go quickly. Um, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an optimist, I think that's the right term. So I, I try to think of the, the best and the good things in life. I always have been, and hopefully it will always be that. We have a lot of good people in Fayette County. I mean a lot of good people. You know, I can name you the bad kids in Fayette County because they're all on a probation list over in my office. And it, you can almost memorize the list because it's not, a, it, it's really not a long list. I can't name all the good kids we have. Open up the paper and you'll see all the kids with 4 H projects that have, that, that have done great things, things that have done good things all across this county. And they continue. And, and, and that, my, you know, my hat goes off to you, the parents. You're raising good kids. But unfortunately, even the good kids stumble. And uh, although I'm not here to talk about the kids because this heroin epidemic is not a, a, a teenager epidemic. We're very fortunate uh, that it's not affecting our teenagers. It's affecting our young adults, those that are 20, 30, 40, 50 years old. And I can say young adults at 50 now. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've gone over that limit. So. <clears throat> but from a law enforcement perspective, we deal with this on a daily basis. And, and sometimes on an hourly basis. Every few minutes, we're seeing that seems that we're getting uh, overdose calls. And it, it really affects us in law enforcement. But we really, I mean, we, we, we get cynical. Um, we often turn negative. We bring, we bring it home to our families and we're negative with our families because we see it. And you may not see it. You may not see the, the multitude of, of the drug problems that we have. You may read, read about it, you may see an obituary, you may 
You know, those things that we can just close the paper and we move on. We don't have that opportunity, unfortunately. Uh, we're seeing it every day. Um, so we relish the times that we can work effectively and positively with our community. When we're interacting with good things in our community, when we're seeing the good things. You know, I get a note every once in a while from uh, um, the uh, National Day of Prayer Committee. They send out, they're the ones that send out little cards. You know, that's encouraging. That is so encouraging, man. And I hope you're sending it to everybody else. <laughs> because to get that thinking that someone is thinking about me, uh, and my deputies, and under the police officers in Worship Courthouse, as much as you hear the negative stuff, we are working very closely together. We're a team, and we're trying to do the best we can. And it's, it's a struggle. My guys in the jail, and I, I, you know, we, I, I, this is not a plug for the new jail, which I really just did one. <laughs> but I, we, we have to deal with what we have right now. And we have a 133-year-old jail that we're expected to do things that brand new jails do. And, and, and we have to do that. My guys are stressed out. We have, we, we've been running 70 people in our jail. And I've got young guys, young men and women up there that are dealing with these problems that, that they shouldn't have to deal with. You know, that's what the Barry Bennett's in the world have to deal with. I told Barry in the hallway, I said, you know, he said, well, you know, take me to jail. I said, I'd gladly take him to jail. You know, I'd like to keep him up there 24 hours a day. Uh, because those people in there need him. They need the programs that we are talking about the programs that Barry Bennett is putting on, the programs that Community Action put on, the program that Pink Valley Mental Health put on, the programs, and many of the programs that we have out there, they need those services. They need, I have a person in jail that begged me to stay in jail. She'd been in jail for 120 days plus, and she said, please, I want to stay here. I know what's going to happen when I get out. This was her probably 40th arrest. Um, she's lost everything. She lost her children. Uh, parents have died of overdose, or, of, of addiction, not overdose, but addiction. So her addiction is just a, I presume, hereditary, or there seems to be. Uh, and she said, please, I don't want to leave. I want to stay here. Because here I know I'm sober. And I, here I know I'm going to be all right. And she was. Until time that came, her time for release, she left. And within a week, she had already overdosed. She's now, uh, we've, we've arrested her four times since her release. And we don't need to keep her in jail. She needs a, a presidential facility. She need, she's done that eight times, by the way. You know, uh, this is, you know, listen to what Barry had to say. You know, I can listen to him almost, uh, well, I wouldn't, wouldn't listen all night, but I could listen to it for a while. Uh, because I see what he preaches. I see the fact that this addiction is not because they just want to do drugs. The mind has been changed. It's a physical change in that mind. They no longer have control over their desires. I had a mother tell me that she would step over a dead baby's body to get hair. That's how bad she, she was addicted. Now, <clears throat> we, our numbers are looking fairly good. If you, if, but not, that's not from a parent's perspective. That's from a law enforcement perspective. If my child was one of these that's, that's overdosing you know, on a regular basis or that died from an overdose, we, you know, they, we're going to see this as a major problem. Uh, but we're, we had seven people die in the month of February. We had 55 overdoses that we were able to record. Now that, we don't know how many others happened that we just weren't called on. But we had 55 that we responded to in the month of February. Seven people died that month. We started the Narcan, uh, and at the end of February, we went to the health department with the cooperation of the health department. They provided, started providing this Narcan to us. We put in the cruisers. We've had it in our, it's, Narcan's been around for years. It's not a miracle drug, by the way. This is if you've been if you've had surgery, you've had Narcan. You know, it, it's a, it's a prescribed medicine that they use, so it's nothing new. We just found a new use for it. Mm. 
uh, that it, it blocks the, the uh, and I, I can't tell you all these things, it, it blocks the opioid uh, sensors and, and you come out of the overdose. And people keep saying, oh, oh, you know, why are we doing that? One time and that's it. One time's a free ride, the second time we're not going to do it. I'll tell you, from a law enforcement perspective, I'm tired of seeing dead bodies. Amen. I see a lot of them. I see so many of them in my career. And that's part of my job, and I accept that. I recognize that. But if I can prevent one more person from dying. February was our high month. We started using Narcan in February. We've never had the, that volume of deaths in, the, in, the, in any given month since then. And I, 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 can't, I can't sit here and contribute at all to Narcan, but I'm saying I believe there's a correlation there between uh, the, the, uh, the uptick and the use of Narcan to saving their lives. And if we don't save them, there's nothing we can do. We just might as well go on home and, and uh, if, if we think that we're above, uh, that we're the, the, the decision-making process, who's going to live and die? Uh, uh, I've, I've given my guys the tools and, and uh, they're using it. The Life Squad uses it on a more regular basis we're, and we're seeing multiple uses in, in one take and in, in one setting because of the uh, fentanyl. Um, I, I, I suppose I should look at Christy. That's, I'm done. <laughs> um, what we're going to look at in the future, just give me another 30 seconds of this. Uh, what we're going to look at in the future, I think, we're going to see the Narcan, we're going to see the heroin. Our people aren't dying of heroin overdoses, by the way. I don't know if you'll, but, uh, you know, we're dying of fentanyl overdoses. You know, that's what we're dying from. Now, we do, people do die from heroin overdoses, but there have been people that's been addicted to heroin for 20 years. But they, they, they're not going to be addicted to fentanyl for 20 years, I can assure you. It, it kills people. Um, and, and, it, and hopefully we're going to see, I think we'll see a, a diminishing of the heroin use, and hopefully a diminishing. And, but unfortunately, what, I'm, what we're seeing, what I'm hearing uh, in the many meetings that I attend and the trainings that I go through across the country, um, and I'm sure, I don't know if, if Barry can, is hearing the same thing yet or not, but, Ours is going to be the cocaine is going to come back. And, and cocaine is going to come back. It's now, met the, the Mexican cartel has developed a more powerful and a cheaper version of, of cocaine. And that's going to be our next curve. Probably. Hopefully it doesn't hit Fayette County, but we need to be prepared for that. And it takes a consistent effort of this community working together like we are tonight uh, to, 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 to fight that battle on a given day. Um, and I appreciate the support that you give the, the law enforcement. We are we're committed to serving you um, and doing the best we can. Uh, we have limited resources, um, but we are there. Uh, and we're, we're, we're continue to work what we have to do on a daily basis. Thank you. can't have a church gathering without the Word of God. How we believe the Word is still good in every situation and still relevant to us. We have two pastors that have been made besides the tag team. We have tag teamed them together to give us some scripture about our, our uh, dilemma. So it's Barry Pettit and Todd Maurer. Make them welcome one more time. This uh, time of the year, this time of the year, there we are, <laughs> let's try that again. I noticed the trees changing. How many of you guys started noticing that? It seems like though this year, like the leaves are just falling off the trees and there's not a big change. But one of the things that uh, comes to my mind when I see the leaves falling is my wife has to begin to rake those and I feel really bad for her uh, this time of the year. made me think about how Jesus would tell stories and he would take things simple as trees to teach a lesson. And there's no doubt the problem that we're facing we're going to have to face together. We're not going to be able to do it by ourselves. It's going to take each and every one of us linking arms and coming together. The largest trees in the, war, in the world are sequoia trees. They're found in California. And some of those trees are 300 feet tall. 
And we find that some of those trees have been around for 4,000 years, which means those trees were actually here on the earth when Jesus walked this earth. And the interesting thing about these trees, they become huge and they get so tall. But if you ever notice a sequoia tree, they are planted beside other sequoia trees. The reason for that is sequoia trees have shallow root systems and if they would stand by themselves, the winds of life and the weather and the things that would come their way would actually cause them to fall over because they're so heavy. But because their roots are intertwined with one another, they're able to stand up in the midst of all the storms that they face. I believe tonight it's important for you and I to know that we are always better together. That we are many congregations, but we are one church. And so the Word of God says in Ecclesiastes chapter 4, verses 9 through 12, these words, Two are better off than one, for they can help each other succeed. And if one person fails, the other one can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Likewise, two people lying close together can keep each other warm, but how can one be warm alone? A person standing alone can be attacked and defeated, but two can stand back to back and conquer. Three are even better, for a triple braided cord is not easily broken. We see in that passage there is a cord of three strands, and I believe that is you and me in Jesus Christ who is going to make the difference for what we're dealing with in our community. We are better together. And don't you forget that tonight when you go home. Amen. Gary and I are so thankful tonight that we've been asked to share God's word because, you know, everything that we've talked about tonight is so important. Gosh, Barry, thank you so much. You gave us a wealth of information. Vernon, thank you so much. You know, we all believe that we all know you. Without the Word of God, that doesn't matter. We've got to have God. And we've got to have His Word. And we, as Christians, have got to believe. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, the bold print in my Bible begins like this. Treasures in fragile clay jars. Man, isn't that where we are? And yet Paul begins by saying in this passage that God has given us this new way to live. And the new way is the light of Jesus in this world. But he goes further than that. Not just in this world, but he says, this light that God has given us, Jesus, is now in us. And it's shining. And when we're not shining as brightly as we can, then we're not doing our job. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, beginning with verse 7, we read these words. We now have this light shining in our hearts. But we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side by troubles, but we are not crushed. We are perplexed, but we are not beaten down, but never abandoned by God. We get knocked down, but we are not destroyed. Amen. Through suffering, not our bodies continue to share in its death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may be seen in our bodies. Gosh, we, we've got to be the light that has been given to us from God. To shine brightly. Thank you for being here tonight. You are the light of the world. Let's be that in our country. Um, hi, I'm Corey Sword, and uh, this is my wife, Sorry Sword, and. Uh, uh, we're here today to uh, just share with you the uh, life changing power of uh, Jesus Christ um, in our lives. I was uh, held in bondage to drugs and alcohol for uh, a bigger part of my life, uh, probably 15 years, um, whether um, that be alcohol, uh, marijuana, cocaine, crack, heroin, uh, pills. Um, 
pretty much uh, I've ran the gamut um, as far as what type of um, drugs that I've done. Um, so uh, a little background on that, uh, don't want to share too much and give the devil too much credit, um, but uh, real quickly, uh, grew up here in Washington Courthouse. Both parents were alcoholics and, uh, and drug addicts and uh, uh, childhood was uh, a little rough. So uh, started using drugs and alcohol probably at the age of 13. Uh, 12, 13 was when I drank my first beer and, and caught my first buzz. What Satan did with drugs and alcohol was uh, steal, kill, and destroy. See, there, there have been many things in my life that, that Satan has used drugs and alcohol to steal from me, whether it be uh, financial things or, or relationships or trust. And, and he has destroyed uh, a lot of things also, um, whether it be a reputation or... Um, you know relationships or uh, my emotions um, just anything he could to, to tear me down um, mm -hmm. and and pretty much he almost killed me um, you know there were uh, many instances through my drug and alcohol addictions that um, I probably should be dead um, or in prison um, so uh, to say all that uh, brings me to the the good news uh, the good news of Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, in 2007, I got married to my beautiful wife, and uh, <laughs> and it was uh, her. It was she was the one who, um, in 2006, um, invited me to come to church, and uh, and I was a mess at that moment. And uh, so we we started going to Grace Community Church, uh, doing the church thing on Sunday, but I was uh, pretty much doing whatever I wanted uh, the rest of the week. I go to The Refuge, which is a 13-month Christian ministry for men who struggle with drugs and alcohol, um, and uh, go there, and uh, the Holy Spirit uh, began to just work on my heart and uh, completely transform uh, my heart, and uh, not only, um, you know, not only just my heart, but physically, emotionally began to heal me and uh and just uh transform me and uh you know that guy that i was going into the refuge was was not the same guy coming out you know i have i have ha hit a few bumps in the road um i have had relapses since then uh but once you accept jesus christ into your heart there's there's no going back um i just he's always been chasing me and uh <laughs> And so, uh, July 23rd of, see, five years ago uh, would be the last time that uh, I've drank or used uh, any drugs. And uh, mm -hmm. so, today we're five years clean. Uh, well, not today, but July 23rd of this year, I was five years clean. Well, I'm just here to, um, you know, really share that Jesus came to set the captive free. Amen. Amen. And um, I was a captive to Satan's lies, like Corey was, and many others are, um, all of us are, before we get saved. Um, so I was a captive to Satan's lies of believing that um, something could uh, fill the voids. And I was buying into many different things, just like Corey was when I was younger. I could fill an emptiness in my heart with... Um, relationships or friendships or jobs, money, education, and um, uh, I, I, he led me down, Satan led me down to a path of drugs and um, to fill voids, to escape reality, to numb out um, from disappointments and hurts in life. And um, those um, drugs, uh, numbed and escaped me temporary and then I would only add to the disappointment and hurt because of my choices of using drugs and actually like in at USA when I worked at USA there was uh, a gentleman um, that shared Christ with me seeds were planted I, I, looking back people were planting seeds and telling me they were praying for me and sharing what the true answer was and um, I 
my heart wasn't softened yet and I knew that I wanted to be in a church and so um, I had been going to different churches in the community and all wonderful churches and um, Atlanta knew that and um, was just each day maybe you know just being very um, kind and loving to me even uh, even though I knew she knew um, what my lifestyle was like she was loving and um, and so she uh, shared with me a name of a person that she uh, recommended that I go talk to and her name's Denova Stickley and she's at Grace Community Church um, and so um, I went and talked to her and that's when God just softened my heart and unveiled my eyes and um, that's the day I got saved and um, my life started changing. The life-changing power of, of Jesus Christ, it's real and uh, it's relevant and uh, uh, we, were, we were both two broken individuals um, who were uh, seeking and, and after, after something to fill a void in our lives mm -hmm. and, and even though uh, we're not, we don't do drugs and alcohol anymore, we've also came to know that we can't fill fill that void either uh, for each other and um, there's only there's only one true king and, and that is jesus christ amen and uh and he's the one who has to fill our hearts it's actually been over 12 years ago and to think about where god has brought us from from that moment until now um is a miracle um, so when when people say that you know i don't believe in miracles anymore well you're looking at a miracle i just want to say to the addict out there that there's no high like the most high and you surrender your life to jesus christ um, it is a journey it doesn't mean that you're not going to have trials and tribulations but he will provide mm -hmm. what you need and more Amen. to face this life and to face what's ahead of you Amen.
Good evening. I've heard it a lot tonight and lately. Many congregations, one church, and it is amazing to see our community come together for such a needed cause. And as Christians and as followers of Christ, we can't stop talking about him. We have to put his word out there and, as the pastor said, let our light shine to draw those that are lost to us. This is city you found behind Life is like a fire. 
We've learned a lot. It's been a good evening. You've been a tremendous audience. Thank you so much for being so attentive. Uh, we do have just a couple more things. Leah Foster, her daughter Lynn, uh, and Dale Lynch after them. They have some tremendous information for us. Would you make them welcome? And my daughter and I are going to share this speech. So if you would please close your eyes just for a minute. I want you to think about famous nursery rhyme. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Now open your eyes. I want to introduce you to the most beautiful Humpty of all times. I may be a little biased, but this is my daughter, Len. <laughs> As all addicts are, she was broken here, and she was broken here. But after being extensively treated and gaining the proper tools in an evidence-based center, she has learned how to pick up the pieces and put herself back together again. Amen. Change your direction. Those tools should be with the help of church and AA, but ultimately each addict needs to love themselves again. They need to feel self-worth of them. Everyone has a value. This community has a female evidence-based treatment center. We have nothing for the male population. The same males cycle through our system over and over, with no light at the end of the tunnel. We need to have a center that can provide them with proper tools to start the healing process, but we need the, we need the community's help. Thanks to the generosity of a joint effort between the city, county, and Union Township, we have a building for the center. Now we need to have it remodeled to bring it up to code for treatment, both inpatient and outpatient. Additionally, and as important, we are looking to build an aftercare treatment, <coughs> excuse me, treatment housing unit so that recovering sober addicts can have a safe environment to util utilize their tools and develop a productive life one day at a time. The scariest day for a recovering addict is the day they leave treatment. They've lived six months in an environment where they are told what to do, how to do it, and when it should be done. Now that individual has to utilize those skills and apply them, with landmines all around them. It takes time to build the strength and endurance to fight the fight. Aftercare treatment provides that time and proper environment to do so, so each sober addict can go forward and deal with the thing they call life. This all takes funding. We ask that you consider donating to this cause to help that one person learn how to love themselves again. Thank you for any consideration. And my evidence stands next to me that this really does truly work if you work it. And thank you for your time. Well, we're almost to the end of the program, and this is really not what I was supposed to say to start, but I'm going to say it anyway. In a country and a world that seems so divided politically in every other way, I am so thankful that we have pastors in this community who are willing to set aside any denominational differences and come together. That's what I think the whole country could learn from what we're doing here. I was uh, commissioned this evening to talk to you about one of the handouts that is on uh, the back table as you go out. And I encourage you to stop by and pick up uh, all those handouts that are extremely important. One of them we've been working on in Faith and Recovery talks about the fact that a lot of people out there, and I even believe some Christians, say, you know, why? Are you messing around with these people? If they're so stupid to take drugs, just let them die. I do not think that is what God wants us to do. And so we put together a list of things for those who think, well, if you let them die, it doesn't cost us anything anymore. Oh, yes, it does. Oh, yes, it does. And so there's a list out there of costs to all of us as taxpaying citizens uh, for people who are addicts. But this morning I decided instead of talking more about that, 
I was going to come at it from a different standpoint. I think uh, as I was sitting in church this morning, God said, you got to say something different. So I'm telling you that there are people out there who think these addicts, can you imagine that beautiful young girl here if somebody said, just let her die? God wants us as Christians, I think, to lead the fight. And we have got to be the ones who lead the fight because I think the rest of the world isn't going to help us unless we show them how to help us. So please, you know, all of us are going to come someday before the Lord. And he's going to say, I'm really glad that you believe in me, but did you help feed my hungry? Did you help clothe those who are naked? Did you help heal those who are sick? Barry told you what a sickness addiction is. I want to be able to stand before the Lord and say, yes, I did help. I gave my money. I gave my time. I provided that light that Pastor Todd was talking about to solve this problem. Because we're the ones who are going to solve the problem. When I say we, I mean the Christian family. And so please join with us. There's, as Leah was saying, there's uh, things out there that you can uh, contribute. If you have groups that would do it, if, you, if your church would do it, whatever, uh, we would appreciate it. If you want to write a check tonight, we're going to be taking up an offering here in a minute. The offering will go to the Faith and Recovery Mission, but the check should be made out to Community Action. It doesn't go to Community Action for one of their services. It goes for Faith and Recovery, so you could indicate on there it's for Faith and Recovery. Uh, our former pastor always closed his sermons with offer people help. You can do that by helping financially and in other ways. <coughs> Offer people hope. You can do that by helping get them into a treatment center where they will find hope. But most importantly, offer people Jesus. Amen. At this time, we're going to have a uh, collection, an offering. Again, the money that we collect this evening is going to go to Faith and Recovery. So thank you so much for attending and thank you for your help. So our ushers, get into place. Thank you so much for being here this evening, folks, and to know this, that we need to do something. And now we can begin that process. Father, thank you so much for the chance to give. Help us, Lord, to give from hearts that are cheerful, and believe, Lord, that you are the true transformer of lives. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Jesus, I've been Alcoholics Anonymous for five years in jail in every town I lived in. Raised in a Christian home. But I remember my dad fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. He got a hold of God. The fire conviction came on me when I was sitting in a bar. And I was delivered, set free by the power of the blood of Calvary. Yeah. But something else happened that came to my mind, Barry, when you were talking about the hundreds that are waiting. I had a dear friend that next week that was sitting at my front door about 7 o'clock in the morning, Stan Kohler, and he started taking me out to breakfast every morning for weeks and months. 
He kept sowing into my life until I was strong enough to make it. And I want to challenge everybody that's here tonight to remember we have the answer. God is a delivering God. Jesus died on Calvary that we could overcome this sinful world that we live in because we live in a fallen world. But we, as God's children, have to be available. We have to be there. I was just thinking a while ago how many people do I rub shoulders with that would know that I'm there for them. Lord, open our hearts. Open the doors that we can be the light that you intended us to be. Father, I pray that you'll set a fire in us. That Lord will be able to go out of this place and realize that God's work is accomplished by God's people. Blessed are the feet that take the gospel. So Lord, empower us. And help us to understand and have this commitment and this urgency to see people saved. To see them delivered and set free. And to be your hands and your feet and your comfort and your mouthpiece. And all the things that you've given us to do, Lord, help us to understand that in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's pray, shall we? <clears throat> Almighty God, we know your scripture. It is eternal, it is true, it is never failing. We know, Lord, that you created this world perfect. And your creation was good. And all was as it should be. And you created mankind in your own image, with your thumbprint on every one of us, so that we would be in relationship with you. And it was our choice, Lord, to break that relationship, to go our own way, to do what we wanted to do, and not what you would have us to do. Lord, every single person in this room can point to sin, because we have experienced it, we live in the midst of it, and Lord, we have committed it. But Lord, you have sent us a definitive answer once and for all time, and that answer is Jesus Christ. And Lord, it is impossible to follow the Lord without carrying our cross. We cannot live as disciples of Jesus, Lord, without carrying the burden of discipleship, without following the way of the Lord, without living, Lord, lives of suffering and sacrifice for your sake. And so, God, tonight, before we leave this place, we ask that you would search us all out. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would soften hard hearts. If there is, Lord, any of us this evening who... is stubborn about this issue. Looks down on others, Lord, who may struggle with this issue. Though we certainly struggle with issues of our own. Lord, if there's any among us who needs to have their mind changed, their hearts softened, their wills shaped for the sake of the gospel in this community, we ask that you would not allow us to leave this place until that is accomplished. God, our community, our county, our state, our nation is hurting and broken. And we are responsible. We confess the sin, Lord, that we have not been participants in your work of redemption. We ask, Lord, that you would equip us to start doing so. 
We will mess this up. We are human beings. We are fallible. We're prone to all kinds of errors. There are all kinds of misjudgments. But you are a redemptive God. You are a saving God. You told us, Lord, that if any of us asks wisdom, we can ask of you, who will not fall us for the asking. So, God, as we leave here, we ask that you would enlighten us, embolden us, encourage us, provoke within us, Lord, a godly wrath against the sin that so easily entangles us and our community and our nation. God, in years to come, let people say something wonderful happened down there in Fayette County. Something wonderful happened that can only be explained by the power of God. Because those people could not possibly have done that themselves. It's exactly the Lord what we want and where we want to be. Almighty God, what we know not teach us. And what we have not give us. And what we are not make us. Not for our sakes. But for the sakes of others. That you, Father, would be glorified. So that the Son would be lifted up and exalted. And that the power of the Holy Spirit would be made known in a way that he has never been made known before in this county. Oh Lord, let it be. All God's people said. Amen. 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 Peace, saints. Take a joke. All right, let's stand together. If you shake at least five people's hands, well, let's go. Have a great evening. God bless you.